Um, thank you, Aluche. I will now share my screen. You all see my screen? Okay, oops. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's... Okay, uh, so first I would like to thank the organizers to uh, give me the opportunity to talk in this uh, workshop, which has been really inspiring with a lot of, of um, good talks and um, interesting people together. Uh, as Alice said, the work I'm going to present is mainly the work of Lea Pradier, who is about to defend her PhD. And uh, she worked on the broad scale propagation of aminoglycoside resistance. And today I will present some of her results um, uh, doing a focus on plasmid and mobile genetic elements. So the context of this work was, as, uh, as many of the work we have seen, uh, the propagation of the antibiotic resistances and uh, the public health problem they represent with the numbers that we all know of uh, millions of people um, waiting to die from uh, antibiotic resistance infection. And, um, and so these genes are present all around uh, the world and they have propagated quite rapidly uh, after uh, we started to use antibiotics as, uh, as treatment. And there are actually two ways by which, two, two big ways, two new ways by which they can propagate. The first one is uh, through spatial movement of bacteria carrying resistance genes. By spatial, I mean uh, geographical movement from one region to another, one country to another, but also ecological movement from one biome to, to another, one environment to another. And the other um, way by which they can propagate is, of course, by horizontal gene transfer. So the transfer of the gene from one species uh, to another or one strain to another. So the general goals of uh, the study that Lea conducted was to describe the resistance propagation patterns and then to try to better understand the, the factors and the mechanisms and the evolutionary forces that were defining uh, the movement and the direction of the movement of these resistance genes. And as I said, I will um, today focus on, on specific things we found about a plasmid and mobile genetic element carriage. Um, so we uh, decided to focus on aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. So aminoglycosides are antibiotics that have been used since the 40s to treat uh, gram-negative infections. They are antibiotics that are naturally produced by streptomyces and uh, micromonospora. They act by fixing on the 30S ribosomal subunit. And uh, in the last decade, there has been a reduction of their use in human medicine, but they are still intensively used in veterinary medicine and in agriculture. Um, as for many other antibiotics, there are uh, diverse uh, resistance mechanisms, but here we will focus on resistance genes that code for enzymes that modify the aminoglycoside by transferring either an acetyl, a phosphoryl, or a nucleotidyl group. So the goal was really to have an integrative and broad scale uh, approach of this propagation. And uh, so uh, we conducted uh, many bioinformatics study. And the starting point was to gather all the protein sequences of amino glycoside uh, modifying enzymes that were known. And from these sequences that are uh, classified but with a biochemical classification, we constructed uh, clusters of homologous genes uh, meaning clusters of, of sequences that we expect to have uh, a common ancestry. So we generated more of an evolutionary classification of these genes. On the other end, we uh, collected all the available eubacteria uh, genomes uh, on NCBI at the time the study was started. And together with these genomes, we also collected uh, metadata. So when, it, when they were available, so uh, the date, the place where uh, the, the isolate was collected, and also, uh, when possible, information about the environment, the biome in which it was isolated. And so we screened all these genomes for the presence of uh, the 27 clusters of resistance genes. And uh, we also uh, taxonomically assigned these uh, genomes to a large uh, phylogeny of the bacteria 
um, which is based on the 120 genes that are ubiquitous in all bacteria species, almost all bacteria species. Uh, once we had this uh, matrix of uh, presence absence of genes in species, we also uh, looked at the genomic context of the resistance genes that we had identified. And so we screened for the, the, around uh, the, the genes for the presence of uh, different mobile genetic elements, namely plasmids, prophages, uh, integrative conjugated elements, and transposons. And I want to note here that for the plasmids, um, we used a tool that uh, Lea developed called PlasForest that is based that is uh, based on homology and using a uh, random forest uh, classifier to identify plasmid in partially assembled genome. The last thing we did to assemble the data set was to infer the resistance spectrum based on the presence of the different uh, resistance genes and using database uh, of resistance comfort. So by the resistance spectrum, I mean the specific amino glycoside to which the genes were conferring resistance. So um, with this data set, we can uh, get an idea of the temporal dynamics, which is what is represented here. So here in, uh, in black, you have uh, the proportion of the genomes carrying a resistance genes a long time. So you can see that, of course, very early in time, we have very few genomes. So this estimate is uh, quite bad. So the confidence interval is quite large. But then when we go in time, we have better and better um, confidence interval. And you can see uh, that we seem to have reached a plateau with quite a lot of variation between years. I want to point here that, of course, uh, this data set, the genome data set, is uh, strongly biased because we, we got what was uh, in NCBI and that there is a clear bias towards uh, samples that have been collected uh, in clinic. So this is to say that probably uh, if we, sample, we could sample all the bacteria of the world, the proportion of, uh, of them carrying amino glycoside resistance wouldn't be 30%. Then we can uh, zoom on the time periods and decompose this, uh, this proportion into the frequencies of the different uh, cluster of homologous genes that we have screened. And you see that we have a general dynamic of a coexistence of the different clusters and not a replacement dynamic, even though we have some trends as in like reduction of frequency for this um, light green clone or um, a temporal peak like for the, the red clone. And then if we decompose this by geographical location, we can see local dynamics that are with more variation and uh, coexistence at the moment. The worldwide is sometimes due to the presence uh, of different things in different places. Uh, we can also look uh, in which phyla we find each which um, cluster of homologous genes. And you can see that some clusters are very widespread phylogenetically, present in a lot of phyla, whereas others uh, are present only uh, in, in some uh, in a very limited number of, of phyla. If we read this table in the other direction, we have uh, clearly phyla that, that are uh, carrying uh, a lot of di uh, different uh, clusters of homologous genes when some others seem to carry only a very limited number of clusters. Um, we can also look at the, the variation of association of these different clusters with uh, different mobile genetic elements. So this is what is represented on this graph. You can see that the, the, the association is basically varying from zero to one. So some clusters are never associated to um, mobile genetic elements, while others are always associated. You can also see uh, that plasmids are quite uh, highly represented. So that's the two uh, blue shades. And uh, that it's quite often that they are associated to two types of mobile genetic elements, a transposon or integral, and uh, something else. So, so uh, plasmid plus transposon or phage plus transposon. And we actually uh, uh, grouped these different uh, mobile genetic elements in three categories. Uh, so that's exactly the same data as the slide before, but this time we have classified them in nested. So that's the case where a transposon is on a plasmid or in a phage. Um, and then in mobile genetic elements that are moving within genomes and those that are mainly moving um, between genomes. 
Uh, and so with this classification, we have looked at how the, the carriage by mobile genetic elements is influencing uh, the resistance spectrum and how it changes with the number of amino glycoside resistance genes. So first, we have noticed that it's quite common to find genomes that have several uh, resistance genes. Then we inferred the resistance spectrum and we compared the observed increase of uh, the resistance spectrum with the number of amino glycoside resistance genes, which is what is represented in each of these plots by uh, the green line, the, the black line. And we compared that to uh, what we could predict from a random reassortment of the genes in the genome. So you see that when the genes are not associated with mobile genetic elements, the observed is uh, strictly within the predicted. Um, it's not different in the case of uh, association with intragenomic mobile genetic elements, but in the case of intergenomic mobile genetic elements, we have an increase of the spectrum breadth that is uh, faster than predicted just, that is stronger than predicted just from uh, a random uh, association. So it seems that intergenomic uh, mobile genetic elements are associated with a broadening of the resistance spectrum. Uh, by the same type of analysis, we have also uh, shown that the association with mobile genetic elements is increasing the number of copies of the same uh, cluster that we have within a genome. And this number of copies actually probably quite often underestimated because when there is a copy on the plasmid, we count one copy, but we know that many plasmid are actually multi-copy. So this presence of the same, uh, of copies of the same resistance gene within a genome is on one side probably linked to an increase of the expression level. That's something that is known from experimental data. And on the other side, we know that uh, it's also increasing the potential for uh, neo-functionalization and differentiation, and also probably uh, in this sense, increase of the resistance rate. Then from uh, the data set we assembled, we have this uh, presence absence of uh, clusters uh, across uh, all the phylogeny of bacteria. So we can, for a cluster, identify pairs of genomes that contain a gene of the same cluster and ask whether it's likely or not that this gene has been transferred horizontally. So to ask this question, we first generated the distribution of the distances um, for the 120 ubiquitous genes that were used to, uh, to assign taxonomically. And so this distribution is what we use as the reference uh, for vertically transmitted genes. And then we compare the distance between the two amino glycoside resistance genes to this distribution. And if the distance between the resistance gene is significantly lower than uh, the minimum of this, uh, of this distance, we, uh, we decide that this uh, is a candidate for um, horizontal gene transfer. Um, so then we refined this uh, identification of horizontal gene transfer by using compositional distances to do uh, what would be the, the, the rational that uh, transfer gene is going to be more similar in terms of composition to the donor species than to the receiver species. And using this, we uh, identified the two genomes that were most likely to have exchange the gene in the case where a genome was involved in different pairs of potential horizontal gene transfer, and also uh, to orient the transfer. So decide in a pair of, of genomes, which was the most likely to be the donor and which was the most likely to be the receiver. Once we have done that on uh, the, the data set for six of the gene clusters, we can reconstitute this kind of uh, oriented network where each of the node is um, a species, or um, I think here a genus on this, and the arrows represent a horizontal transfer uh, that are oriented. Um, we can then study the, the structure and the topology of these uh, networks. And uh, something that was uh, quite clear on all of this network is that there is a structuration between donors and receivers. So uh, there are very few cases where uh, species that are very frequently donors are also very frequently receivers. The, the role seems to be uh, divided between the species. Um, 
we can also uh, identify that some species are always donors and these species that are always donors are not species that are um, very, uh, very often associated with uh, clinical environments or even associated to humans. They are more soil species. And um, I want to draw your attention on the fact that these two streptomyces species come back quite often as, as um, donors of resistance. So it means that streptomyces is both a producer of antibiotic and donor of the genes to resist to this antibiotic. On the other hand, some species are always on the receiver side, and that's the case of uh, E. coli or Shigella. So uh, by this analysis of oriented horizontal gene transfer networks, we have shown that there seems to be a large role of non-pathogenic soil bacteria in the horizontal propagation of our resistance gene. Then we also uh, performed another type of analysis on these networks, and we tried to uh, find the factors that were influencing the probability of a successful transfer between a donor and a receiver. And um, so this, uh, this analysis showed that there is often, that there is a negative effect of large phylogenetic and large ecological distances. Uh, that's something that has been identified on, on other data sets and that is known from mechanistic explanation, but that was, that was uh, nice and reassuring to, to find that on our data set. We could also identify a negative effect of codon usage differences between the transfer gene and the receiver genome. That's also a known barrier to horizontal gene transfer. And I uh, just want to, to explain a bit why this is. So um, the synonyms codons uh, are not used at equal frequency within the genome. And the frequencies at which they are used vary between species. Uh, so uh, they are different from one species to another. And they are expected, and they have been shown to be shaped uh, partly by the coevolution with the translation machinery. And in particular, there is usually a quite good match between the frequency at which a codon is used and uh, the number of copies of the gene of the tRNA that decode it. So uh, we have this, uh, this uh, coevolution that make a gene uh, nicely translated in its uh, origin genome, but then uh, in the case of horizontal gene transfer between species that have differences in their codon usage, it means that the genes in its receiving genome is using rare codons and it's known to lead to slow translation and the production of erroneous and truncated protein. That's the, the mechanistic explanation for why um, uh, there is a neg negative effect of codon usage on the probability of transfer. So we confirmed the classical barriers and limitation of horizontal gene transfer of our data set, but uh, Probably even more interestingly, we show, and here I show the data for the phylogenetic distance, that it's actually variable depending on the association with uh, mobile genetic elements. So if you look at the uh, red line here, it's the prediction, it's the, the regression of the association between uh, the phylogenetic distance and the probability of success of uh, horizontal gene. And so it's, uh, we have a negative relationship. But then if we look at what's happening for genes that are linked to, that are associated to mobile genetic elements, we can see that for intergenomic uh, MGE, we have an increase, we have an increase of the flux. Um, so it's, transfers are just more likely. Uh, for intragenomic, uh, we have then, we lose the, the decreasing relationship and for nested, uh, mobile genetic elements, we seem to have a, tendon, a trend that is contrary to um, the transfer at large distance seem to be uh, favored. So it means, and, and we have a similar effect uh, of interaction between mobile genetic element carriage and uh, codon usage. So it seems that mobile genetic element carriage allows to bypass, at least in some cases, the classical barriers of two horizontal gene transfer. So to summarize, we have shown an important role of mobile genetic elements in resistance accumulation in genomes and in resistance spectrum broadening. We have identified a large role of non-pathogenic bacteria in the propagation of aminoglycoside resistance genes. Uh, 
Um, the oriented horizontal gene transfer networks uh, confirm the classical barriers to horizontal gene transfer, but we also showed an important role of the mobile genetic element, not only as vehicles transporting the resistance genes, but also as means of uh, jumping over, over the barriers to horizontal gene transfer. So uh, to finish, I would like to um, acknowledge that it's mainly the work of Leah that I presented. I also would like to thank other members of my group and uh, Anna-Sophie Christon-Lavie with whom we collaborated and funding and you for your attention. Nice talk, uh, really, really neat. Um, is there any question? Sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. No, it's empty. Okay. So is there any question for Stephanie? No. So I'll try. Uh, okay. Um, just, so I, I was thinking, you found that E. coli is always a receiver and we have I mean, we thought as much. Um, ah, there is a question from Berenike Meyer. Ah, I cannot see her. Sorry. Thanks, Joachim, for pointing out. Okay, maybe I just go ahead. Go, go, go. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting. So uh, I was wondering about this role of some species uh, um, acting as donors and other acting as receivers. Do you think the reason for this is mechanistic or is this caused by selection mostly? Um, I, I have no definitive question, <laughs> definitive answer to this question. Um, I guess there is a role for selection in the sense that um, uh, a resistance genes that is arriving uh, in a pathogenic species that is more often treated by antibiotics is probably going to be kept Whereas if it's transferred to a species that is never encountering the antibiotic or very rarely, likely that we don't see it or, or we less often see it. Um, so, or, of course, in this type of study, we, we have only the successful part of the story and that's what we, what we analyze. Um, this said, uh, I think so. so um, we also, so that's data that I didn't precisely uh, showed, but uh, there is more transfer from non-pathogenic to pathogenic species than just expected by the frequency of, uh, of these two categories. So, uh, so the selection is acting on the pathogenic species, whatever the origin of the gene they receive uh, comes from. So there seems to be something more than uh, just the, the selective effect. Mm -hmm. Then the precise mechanism by which uh, this is happening that, that could range from um, molecular mechanisms to uh, more uh, ecological arguments. So uh, probably the, the probability of, of contact and, and transfer is more in one direction than in another. But that's, that's I, we didn't find very, uh, very clear cut um, examples of why this could be. Okay, thank you. Okay, there was Yi King Wang with the hand raised. Do you want to ask your own question? Yes, yes. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, I'm interested in uh, the, how to infer the donor and the recipient uh, shape. Um, I, I also construct trees focusing on air margins, but only uh, from the general within enterobacter CA. And uh, my trees always contain uh, uh, polytomy uh, or the, the, the tree is like a comb. I do not have enough snakes to infer a reliable uh, donor and the recipient shape. And uh, I, I don't know, uh, can you comment more on the inferring of uh, donor and the recipient uh, in your data? How, how reliable uh, is that? And uh, 
uh, do you have any suggestion how I can infer the uh, relationship in my data due to the 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 nature of emergence? I found in general they, they are quite conserved uh, within my data. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, resistance genes are, are usually quite conserved. So if you try to uh, reconstruct uh, the phylogeny of the genes on one side and the phylogeny of the species on the other side and apply um, reconciliation methods, for example, I don't know, it's, I, I don't know if it's what you try to do. Um, usually it's not possible because the, well, usually there are many cases in which it's not possible. So that's, that's not the method uh, we use also because the data set was so large that it was actually uh, computationally very complex to, to do that on such a large data set. So that's why we used um, this, uh, this implicit phylogenetic method, um, which I, which is work. So uh, Leah actually did simulations uh, to uh, try to see um, what was the lowest phylogenetic level at which we could um, reliably detect a transfer. So this means that you, you need uh, your distribution of the vertically transmitted gene not to go too, too low. So if you have two species that are really close or two genomes that are really close, of course, your, your resistance genes are never going to be outside of this uh, distribution. So that's a method that works uh, well for um, the genus and above. But below that, the method we use uh, is not reliable either. So that's actually why the majority of the networks we reconstructed are at the genus level. But so I, so probably if you work in intragenus, uh, you, you cannot use this method either, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. We have a last question, I think, from... Jose Delgado, but I'm messing up with everything. Do you want Jose to ask yourself the question or do I read it? Well, it's not answering, I read it. So he says, thanks for a great talk, Stephanie. Have you thought about using this approach for other AMR mechanisms in order to identify uh, their potential environmental donors? Um, thinking of it, yes, doing it is, I mean, um, it's quite an intensive work. So it was uh, three years of PhD of Lea, but I think, I mean, I, I kind of agree with the question that now that the, the analysis are, are set up and the way you do them is set up, it would be really interesting to apply that to other, uh, to other resistance. Um, it is important to note that it can only be applied to resistance that are due to uh, genes, to resistance genes, and not to uh, polymorphism, to SNPs uh, appearing in the, in the genes, because that really need to identify these clusters of homologous genes. But yes, of course, it would be would be interesting and actually interesting to test whether the pattern that we see for aminoglycoside are uh, specific to aminoglycoside or if it's more general with other resistances. Okay, so if there are no further questions, and doesn't seem to not, uh, we have Mario Santer. Uh, Mario, 